my pleasure to introduce Andrew. I forget what you're talking about. Yeah, so I'll, I'll be talking about um, MCR and bar, psi classes, omega classes, and time permitting some of the trees corresponding. Okay, and I should say that um, this is work I based on. This is based on paper I've been reading. That's by uh, Maria, uh, Sean Griffin, and Dave Levinson. So. If there's time at the end, we might get to a little bit of work that I did, but um, if not, then all or most of this is based off of that work. Okay, so to start off with. We're going to be working over m0 n plus 3 bar, um, which is defined to be a set of stable genus 0 curves with n plus 3. And so over here we have already an example, which I'll call C. And C here is an element of M0, that's for sake of 5 plus 3 bar. So M0, 8 bar, um, but three of the points we treat differently, so that's why we have the plus 3 set. And sometimes we'll instead denote this as M0 S bar, where S is a set of labels for our points. So in particular, we'll denote them with A, B, C, 1, up through N. And so we're what we're interested in are uh, projective maps. from M0 and Z bar into some collection of projective spaces. In particular, we're interested in projective maps given by psi and omega classes. So the two particular maps that are given and omega classes. Um, one of them is going to be psi n, which is from n0 to r. This will map to pn cross pn, where we have and copies of PM. And on the other one we will be looking at, omega n is from the same space. And this one goes into P1 cross P2 dot 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 PM. So those are the two maps that I'll be work go through defining and talk about some of their properties. All good so far? Okay. So first of all, so um, our omega classes are base, are defined in terms of our psi classes. So I'll start by talking about psi classes. So so psi classes. Um, so one way they can be defined is that psi i is the first Chern class of a line bundle of i, where this is the um, i-th cotangent line bundle. I don't know a whole lot about what that means yet, but it has something to do um, with you take the cotangent space 
of your curve C at the particular marked point I, um, and then apply whatever your turn class is to that. Uh, so I think Mark talked about those earlier this semester. T turn classes? Oh, turn classes, yeah. Yeah, so, um, yeah, so I'll know more about that li later on, but for now, uh, that's sort of their definition. And then omega classes relate to them by being the pullback. Psi classes under A for getting it. Uh, can, can you maybe say, yeah, but so the fibers of the lie, you said they're the cotangent space of the curve at the i marked point, right? Yes. So the fiber is, yeah, cotangent so space at whatever our point i is. So l is a line bundle mm -hmm. over m, m bar 0 and plus 2? Yes. I think so. At every point you attach the cotangent space to the x point. You want that there, you pass it for m0 and that's yeah. more. And so in particular, you'd have that omega i psi i composed with pi, where pi is a map from m0 n plus 3 bar to m0 i plus 3 bar, where you just forget the forget about the points i plus 1 through m. So if, or you could write it another way, you could instead write Omega i is psi i composed with pi n plus 1, 3 pi n, where here pi sub j is the map that forgets point j. So that would be another way to write the same thing. So, yeah, so I haven't said a whole lot about how these are defined, since for now this is mostly black box for me. Um, so what's important is so yes. you're forgetting the first points or the last points? The last points. The last points. So, yeah. so first forget point n, n minus 1, okay. up through i plus 1, and then apply psi i in that, for that um, fewer pointed moduli space. Right. <laughs> okay. So, so I'm confusing that you have done uh, psi i as a map or a class? Oh, uh, yes. This is this notation would be for the map I'm going to find in a moment. So, I guess. But you can define them um, directly with what you've already written with pullback instead of composition, right? Yeah. So you could just say omega i is pi upper star of psi i. Yeah, so there's a pullback. I just uh, used uh, no, okay. map notation here. So I'll define them course by maps in a moment. Any other questions? That. Yeah, so more important than what these are, for my talk, um, what we're interested in is how do we actually use them. And so that comes from what are called the Kranov maps. Ah, I can spell. So the Kaprav maps is denoted with psi i with the absolute value bars around it. And this is a map from our moduli space into Pn. And so I need some space for this. Three reasons 
So to define what these Caprano maps do, I'm going to first define their values for the interior of our moduli space. So for C inside of and 0 s without the bar, so the interior. So this would be curves with, um, we're basically have one component and all of our marker points on one component. Then psi i of c is going to be, and then here denote the coordinates of our marker points. That's how we're denoting the coordinates of our points, and then we'll have the map is PA minus PB over PI minus PB, PA minus PC Of course, we, did, we remove the term where we have pi minus pi in our denominator, since that's not defined. And so when you say coordinates, what do you mean when the curve has a lot of components? So like, things of this form would all be... He didn't put a bar over m 0 s Oh, I see. This is all smooth curves. Yeah, okay, um, let's try the terminology. So, P to the n to the n hmm? plus 3. Uh, the the call domain. Call domain. Uh, He's asking how many coordinates do you have? There should, we should have n plus 1 coordinates. n plus 1? <coughs> because it's going to PM. Uh, so we have 1 for B, 1 for C. And one for every number, one through n, except for i. Mm -hmm. So we have n minus one here, and n plus one. Mm -hmm. uh, that, so that's why you wrote down p n for the coding, uh, the codon, right? Yeah. yeah. <clears throat> and so by convention, I think that's a T. We'll often ch choose coordinates such that PA is zero and PI is infinity. Then this map becomes we get PB, PC. So our map becomes much simpler in that case. And the half variance means we remove the PI term. Why does setting PI equal to infinity do that? I see the... Like, I just didn't see how you got from step above by convention to the step below by convention. Uh, why does it why does it divide it by infinity? I did not work that all out myself. That was in the paper. So I can gotcha, gotcha. I mean, let's let's see. So yeah, so if these are zero, all our terms will look like um, multiply not everything by this one. We have P B over um, infinity minus P B. Um, and so on. So 
So if you cross multiply by all of the denominators here, uh, um, the sort, you should have le the leading term of the highest power of infinity should be PB, PC, P1, and so on. Okay. Like, let's, yeah, so let's say we just have three coordinates <coughs> in this one. We have PB. This kind of use of notation here, but we'd have infinity squared, something else. And then you do sort of a pseudo L'Hopital's rule, divide out by infinities, everything else in here goes to zero, and you're left with PB, sorry, this is sloppy, PC. I think I got it. Thank you. Yeah. No yeah. Sure, I have not worked that out, so that was good practice. Any other questions? Okay, so that's what these panel maps do for the interior of M0 and R. What about when we're on the boundary? So we have multiple components of our curve. So now let's say we have C as an element of so if we're on the boundary, what do we do? Then oh, so one thing I should Fine. First, I guess, is the dual tree to one of these curves. So let's take our example here, the dual tree, is the tree formed where we create an, a vertex for every component of our curve. So this one, sorry, these four, and then connect them if they're adjacent. And then add another uh, edge with a leaf for every marked point. Of course, my So we have a two, a three, b, a five, one, c, and four. So what we do here is we let C prime be the component. Contain our point i. So if i were 5, we take this component here. And then we apply we first apply psi i to that c prime. So like just ignoring the other components, just calculate things for this one component. That would give us some coordinate for each. Point, marked point, or um, okay, we even call these like um, like intersection points. So it give you a component or a coordinate for each of these. I guess you would give one for a, and then you compose that with a map that in this paper is called iota step sigma. I'm not going to go through the full definition of it, but basically what that does is it takes the component of each of um, these points here and assigns that coordinate to all the points down that branch. So if, say we had, what should I call it, SMT. So like here, if we had coordinates SMT for these two points, it would take everything down this branch and assign S to all of those, and take T and assign that to all of these. So in this example here, um, 
So in our, yes, in our example, sigma 5 of C, well, when we apply psi 5 just to this one component, we'll have an S and a T in some order, so that'd be iota of we have different points S and T, which then by assigning those appropriately, these on the S branch, so we'd have S, and then C and 1 are both on the T branch, so T and T, S, S and T. So that would be the output of psi 5 on C. So basically, it's like we coordinate just this one term and look at what are the coordinates of all our other marked points from the perspective of our point 5. And 5 is on this component here, so it really can't distinguish anything down this branch from each other or anything down that branch from each other. So we all get the same coordinates. And that's sort of a proof by, or a definition by example, but does how, um, these parallel maps work for the boundary. Does that make sense? Okay. And so then we can put. So this was this was just one example. We defined these psi i maps individually. We can put them all together to define the total parallel map. So what is n here? Because you have a five marking and an A B C, so there is an eight marking. Yeah. Oh, so so n is five. Oh, okay. Yeah. 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 N is five, so n zero and five plus three. Part. Definition on the open part always stays away from the big diagonal because none of the coordinates are the same. None of the none of the coordinates. Are the same. Yeah, all the coordinates is the Yeah, because our points have to be distinct. So and then we'll, on the on the boundary, then you have this uh, closure where you, some points, some coordinates are need to be the same. So yeah. Go with that. That's the S and T movement. And I think because because like you otherwise have to have them to be distinct. They you have the same coordinate if and only if they're on the same branch from the perspective from of the your point I. Because like S and T would be able to be equal, or else these two branches would collide with each other, and I'm not exactly sure what would happen then. Right. Yeah. So now with these individual psi i's, we can define the total Caprano map. You know with capital psi is the plot and of C, which is defined to be psi 1 of C cut through psi n of C. And so let's calculate this for our example over here. So first, we need to coordinateize each of our components. So I partially did the first one, so let's give 0 to infinity there. Starts over here. And then this component will be labeled with 0, infinity, u, and v. And we do not we do have to use distinct labels other than zero and infinity for each of our components because like if we choose zero and infinity here, this S here would not necessarily be the same as what either of these two points are here. Okay, so let's calculate. So I guess it's gonna be side five. Our recursion. 
So the first term is would be psi 1. So we do everything from 1's perspective. 1 is labeled with infinity. And the branch where A is is labeled 0. So we can use our simplified version of the math and just have label everything as either 0 or W, since so that's only number, might as well make 1. So the first term, we get B is down the 0 branch. C is down the W branch. It's rescaling to 1. 0, 0, 1, 0. We all good on the first term. For 2, um, I'm going to go ahead and say that it is. It's going to be u, 0, 0, u minus v, 0, 0. Three is going to be u zero zero v zero zero. Four is labeled nicely again. And then psi five is the one we already calculated. That's S T S. Okay, so that's what that map is. So most of so most of these points are fairly easy to calculate because we have infinities labels for most of our uh, numbered points. The only exception there is this two. So we have this u minus v here. So where does that come from? So we go back to the longer form of our definition. The zeros are PA and our PJ, which both belong to the same component, so those are all zeros anyway. What, what happens for the other ones? Well, this first term is negative u. minus u, and we have a negative infinity over v minus infinity. And so that is similar to what I was talking about earlier. You can clear out the denominators. This is equal to negative u. And then again, do you sort of a Lobital-esque thing? Coefficient of our infinity here is u. Coefficient of this is u minus v. So that's where this component comes from. Any questions about that example? So it is the uh, so each psi i is a map to project. Yes. Is the okay, a, a match to project is space is always given by a line bundle and then plus one section. So is the line bundle the L I? Or is it? I don't know. Ray, what do you know? Sorry, what was the question? Is is this like is Psi I like the linear series associated to L I? Yes. Yeah. Yeah, I guess again. This is a map from probably this one three. However, an important thing to note here. is that this total compound map is not an embedding. So for example, if we take two curves, C1 and C2, Well, 
then psi 2 C1 is going to be equal to psi 2 C2. They're both going to give us And this is assuming you have some, even if you have some coordinatization for this. Yeah, but I'm saying there's there's like different, you know, if you look at the left-hand irreducible component of that C2 curve, there's lots of places you could put A, B, C at the node. There's like a M bar M0 for worth of C2s, right? It won't collapse. Yeah. Yes. Mm -hmm. one, one intuition I have for um, like, is that sometimes if you look at like higher order tendency, then when I look at C1, my if you think of like a family of marked P1s degenerating to C1, then somehow like A and B are coming together with higher order tangency than. Um, than the point C. Is that how you're thinking about it also? Mm -hmm. I think so. Yeah, they kind of come together like faster. Mm -hmm. yeah, yeah, I mean, C, C1 is a limit of curves of C2 type. Yeah, that's the yeah. thing. Mm -hmm. <laughs> yeah, you can actually like make a like a path in the moduli space that's mm -hmm. parameterized like based on assigning A, B, and C different like actual parameter values in terms of like T and then let T go to zero. And, it approaches that point. So are you saying the map is not injecting right now? Correct. Okay. So like, no, no matter which curves of these forms you choose, like any curve of this form and any curve of this form are going to be mapped to this same form. This point here. So I, I feel like you're going to fix this in yes. a different way in a second, but I mean, couldn't one other way to fix this be looking at sort of versions of these side maps that also involve A, B, and C? Because you sort of chose to distinguish those, and you've got a psi i for all the other points, but you, know, you could have labeled like different points as your A, B, and C, and, and defined a psi i for the A point done something like that, right? And then that would distinguish these two types of curves. Yes, see what you mean. I, mean. I think, I guess it's part of the problem is that no matter what, we're going from a curve with n plus three points, and we can only choose n different outputs. It's like, in some way or another, we have to choose n of those n plus three points to be the ones we do this on. So no matter what, there's three points. We don't do this point. Is that a reasonable intuition? Yeah. Does that answer your question? But I guess what Mark's saying is it's somehow a choice. Like you could embed it into a higher dimensional space, and this is like a projection onto an n-dimensional space, and in that projection, some of these things get identified. Yeah. I mean, we also could just as well could have permuted our labels around as well. Yeah. Um. Yeah. I mean, maybe it would be more clear where this is heading when you define the other map. Right? Yeah. Okay. Sorry. Mm -hmm. yeah. So, so the problem here is that somehow one and two, neither points one or two, can see how these agencies are related because here, oh, they're just all down. 
that branch if I drew the dual tree. Here is the same thing. They don't they can't see this node here. So we need some way to allow our points to see that distinction. And so what we're gonna do is now we're gonna take the omega classes I mentioned earlier. So rather than just taking these psi i maps, we're going to compose them with some forgetting maps. And so we can define the map omega i to be, so this is the map from n0 n plus 3 bar to pi. So it's not pi anyway, it's pi. So we do this by first forgetting about, I guess that would be n minus i of our points. And then applying psi i to that. So these omega i maps are this composition. So if we get points i plus 1 through n, then apply the psi i map living in that different space to get to pi. And so again, we can do this similar thing, and then we can take them all together, and that will define the iterated. So that, that psi i, that's the last point. Yes, pi is the largest point we don't rest in Martin. Yeah, so there's like a plus a quarter zero. Hmm? Like we're really ordering things just to create this thing. Yeah. So this is omega n, which is mass. And so you'll note that our highest, our, our nth one is going to just be the same thing. So omega n defines the same map as psi. So that gives us our p and q. Then we take omega n minus 1, which forgets one point, so that goes to p n minus 1, and so on. And so, as you might be able to guess, omega n of, of point C is going to be omega 1 of C up through omega n of C. Okay, so let's try, or, yeah, so let's apply this to our curve C. Okay. Oh, I'll just put it in down here. It's a little surprising, it forgets stuff. Yeah, you get, you get more information by forgetting <laughs> things. <laughs> you, could, you could see it on these two curves up there, that would be a good thing to do. Yeah, I'm going to do that. You're going to do that, okay, yeah. It's really nice. Yeah. <laughs> so from, from what we just said earlier, our last, the last term of our map should be the same as we had over here. So we should get the same S T T S S T. Sounds like I'm trying to say stand, semi standard hand but not quite. So that's the last one. But then before we can compute omega 4, we have to look at what does our curve look like after we forget our point 5. So that's going to be similar. Okay, C4 to B. 
So all we do is we just drop off our client five. This component still has three nodes, so it's still stable. And we're doing it from sector four, so we can go ahead and use the same coordinates we had before. So what that is doesn't really matter. We're going to end up with zeros for everything down that way, and then I one for C. So zero, one, zero, zero, zero. Right, because everything except C is down the zero branch, we get zeros and then one. Now what happens when we forget about point four? Over here, this piece is the same. Here we still have A. When we get rid of four, we only have two points here. So this component is no longer stable and collapses. So we end up with A1 and A2 like that. So it doesn't really matter what we choose as our third label because it's always going to rescale to one. So here we get one, one, zero, zero. And finally, forget about point two. This component collapses, he ends up right there. And we end up with zero. So that's what omega n of c is. We have two coordinates, three coordinates, four, five, six coordinates. And so what I'm claiming here is that by forgetting points as we go, we recover all the information about our original curve. So let's verify that with our c1 and c2 up here. First, we should check what happens to both curves when we forget point two. So I guess I'll call those C1 prime and C2 prime. It's going to look like this. C2 prime. Oh, well, we forget the two. It's going to collapse, and all of our points are going to be on the same curve or the same point. By omega 2 to C1. We should get first 0, 1. Omega 2s are the same, but somehow in this, from one's perspective, after 2 is forgotten, one can now see the difference between what's going on here, this is over here. So I'm not really proving that it's an embedding, but I'm claiming that it is. So this allows us to 
get more information out of our code. So any questions there? So basically, uh, forgetting gives us like different stabilization, like C1 prime and C2 prime, and then that kind of distinguish the C1 and C2, I guess. Yeah, so I, I don't know if I'm using standard notation for this or not, I'm just saying, yeah, so this, this is sort of what the curves look like after our first forget, or pi 2 forgetting map, if you want to call it that. And then using that, we get these distinct coordinates 0, 1, and ST, where S can't be 0 because A and B are different points. So these two are always different points in our projection. And you can question? see that as, as s goes to 0 in your pi 2, that's exactly a and b colliding, which and gives you a c1. Yeah, exactly. Mm -hmm. Yeah, so that's what I have on v with the sign omega class. Mm -hmm. So say we want to compute some products here. First, let's say we have K as a composition of N. That is, it's a tuple K1 up to Kn, where Ki's are non negative integers, and they all add up. the composition thing. And say we want to know what is that intersection there. So that's where we multiply k1 copies of psi1 times k2 copies of k2 and so on. So say we want to know what that product is. So for one thing, that's the same as what we call the multi-degree of our map psi. And then this is also the cardinality of a set of trees we call slide psi. And then we can say almost exactly the same thing with omegas. So we want to know what are these products? This is the multinomial coefficient, and choose k1, k2, up to kn. In the second case, we get what are called the asymmetric multinomial coefficients, which is also common to our object. Both can be defined in terms of parking functions or call them restrictive parking functions. There's a lot of, in the second case, there's a lot of combinatorics that's still being worked on. Um, what was the that last one you said, like, mm -hmm. There's asymmetric. Asymmetric. And so one way with this, we can calculate these products by counting the size of these sets of trees. And so we can define these trees using what are known as slide rules. They take a bit of time to state, so I'm not going to say them now. Um, I guess what I'll end with is saying that 
what I worked on um, last spring was finding bijections between the set slide omega of all ones composition and the set of permutations on it. So looking at the trees here when k is all ones and figuring out stuff about the structure to get a bijection. Why that's interesting um, is a more complicated problem, so I'll probably save that for another talk as well. Um, I guess what I'd say here is that the degrees of these products correspond to counting trees, and so common torus is fun because we can count trees with it. That's all I have for today. All right, any other questions? So have you thought about like trying to generalize these computations to uh, Moduli space of like weighted marked curves where you, some marked points can collide with each other if, if their weights match up in the right way. And I have not thought about that at all. I mean, like, all I've, like, as far as research goes, the only thing I've done is look a little bit at this one case of slide omega. Okay. Um, and then I'm working through the background of this, so at some point that might be an interesting question. All right, good questions. Let's think of your